I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, apologize for, I, I guess it didn't uh, matter because the last panel ran a little late, but we were voting until just a couple of minutes ago and I've got a flight to catch in just a few minutes, so uh, forgive me if this speech is a little uh, truncated. But I appreciate being here. As we were talking in the back, uh, Michael Crow was explaining that uh, I come from the town called Snowflake. So I'm a flake from Snowflake, Arizona. I grew up not knowing that flake was a pejorative term because the, t the town was actually named after my great-great-grandfather, William Jordan Flake, and Erastus Snow, another person who helped settle uh, that part of Arizona. But when I moved out here in 1987, I was in a, at a reception, and it came up in conversation with somebody that, my, uh, that I came from Snowflake, but this fellow didn't know my last name was Flake, and it turned out he knew somebody from Snowflake. I don't know how, it's a pretty small town. But, uh, but he was trying to think of the name, and he struggled for the longest time. And uh, finally, I thought I'd help, help him out and narrow it down. I said, was this guy a Flake? And he said, nah, he seemed pretty normal to me. <laughs> so, but I knew from that point that uh, you know, I wasn't safe anywhere, and I sought a place where there were I could be comfortable around more flakes, and so Congress was about the only option, I thought. So. But, uh, but I appreciate the introduction. I'm usually just referred to when you have uh, the other Senator McCain uh, from Arizona. I'm just usually the other Senator from Arizona, so I'm resigned to my lot in life. But uh, I appreciate the uh, assignment uh, that I was given, or loose assignment, to to explain how we can make social contracts great again. No, that wasn't it. <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> no, no, no that, that, that's not it. But I have been asked to, uh, to try to mount a conservative case uh, for a new social contract. Now, I know it's rarely smart to disappoint early on, uh, but I'm not sure that I can make that case, mostly because I'm not sure if I'm smart enough uh, to know exactly what a social contract between an individual and their government is. I, uh, I know that there is considerable debate, and that is a convenient out. But at a minimum, I think we can all agree that the concept, uh, concept aims to describe that relationship between an individual and their government. And on that, I do have a few thoughts. Uh, fundamentally, I, I believe that it's uh, government's role uh, to protect and not inhibit individuals' prospects for prosperity. Now, from the agrarian to manufacturing to a silicon uh, economy, one constant in our domestic economy has been change. And much attention is being paid uh, now to the transitioning U.S. and global economy and we're moving, it seems, uh, to the digital age uh, 2.0. But while the specifics may vary, I don't think this transition alters what we should primarily expect out of government. Along with basic function, there are steps that government can take and should take to make sure that it isn't hindering the success of the individual. And by this, I'm referring to the economic success of the individual. I'm happy to share some of the specifics as reflected in my legislative efforts in the Senate. Now, critical to prosperity is the opportunity for employment uh, and employment for the freedom for willing workers uh, to join with willing employers to move up the economic ladder. Now, unfortunately, our antiquated immigrant, uh, our antiquated immigration system uh, stymies that relationship rather than fostering it. When I first arrived in the Senate, I decided to do something I never thought I'd do. I joined a gang, the, the so-called Gang of Eight. I thought I'd left gang life behind after the mean streets of Snowflake. But, uh, but uh, our effort there uh, was to revise and to modernize our immigration system. Uh, we've got to ensure that the U.S. economy has access to highly skilled foreign talent that it needs now, these folks are often trained in U.S. institutions, uh, like ASU, um, and, uh, but rather than being allowed to stay in the United States, uh, they are often forced back overseas uh, to compete with us or against us on the global stage. 
As our economy moves to its next stage, the U.S. simply needs to retain the status of being where the best and the brightest want to be. Of course, we've got to do a much better job in our K-12 and our universities to uh, promote STEM education. I learned recently that Mexico will graduate as many engineers as the United States will this year, not in a per capita basis, but in raw numbers. We can't hope to compete in today's global marketplace with figures like these. Now, I realize that this may confl conflict with uh, notions that we have of the need to protect the American worker, but in the short to medium term, we've got to, until we can have a sufficient number of homegrown students in the STEM fields, we need to attract foreign students, educate them in our university systems, and provide long-term visas for them to stay long enough to be here and to create jobs. And it's not just the highly skilled uh, that, uh, with which these reforms are critical. I've recently introduced legislation that fills the void that currently exists between temporary visa programs for seasonal workers and the H-1B programs for highly skilled immigrants. And regardless of where they fall on the skill scale, I don't agree uh, with the canard that foreigners are always taking U.S. citizens' jobs. Economic activity is not a zero-sum game, and filling positions with needed talent leads to increased opportunities for everyone. I talk about trade for a minute. In addition to removing barriers for the flow of talent, government needs to work on reducing barriers for trade in the global marketplace. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce reports that uh, more than 95% of the world's consumers and 80% of the purchasing power live and work outside of our borders. In an increasingly global economy, we have to think first and foremost of the financial opportunities that free trade opens up for a variety of sectors in the U.S. economy. And it's not just jobs related to exports. In 2013, the U.S. spent more than $450 billion on research and development, more than any other country on the planet. And those who incessantly worry about the balance of trade with certain countries often fail to consider that a large percentage of our imports simply provide inputs into U.S. manufactured products, products that are then often exported. Do we really think that U.S. companies are going to pour their hard-earned dollars into developing products and technology to sell to the U.S. market alone? And if they don't, where do we think we'll be in the next 20 or 30 years? With calls on my side of the political aisle to renegotiate NAFTA and circle the country with protectionist tariffs, I'm trying to wrap my head around having a Republican candidate for president that for all intents and purposes is running to the left of the Democrat on trade issues. It's a brave new world out there. <laughs> and not good for Republicans, I would argue in my book, if we continue uh, to go against free trade. Now the fact remains that access to global opportunities means very little if your government is burdening you with excess taxes and regulation to the point of smothering any chance of prosperity or being able to compete with your global neighbors. Now, in that line, I'm often surprised at what taxpayer dollars are being spent on. Something I spend quite a bit of time on is trying to curb unnecessary spending. Uh, last week, I put out a report on frivolous NIH studies to see if drunk birds slur when they sing or to see what kind of music chimps prefer. It's Metallica, Metallica if you really want to know. And uh, drunk birds do slur when they sing. Your tax dollars are paying for that kind of thing. We're always expanding already far too generous agricultural subsidies, subsidies that make it very difficult for us to enter into free trade agreements, I might say, with our neighbors as well. We're spending millions of dollars on things like, for DHS, funding uh, party buses in the Hamptons. A lot of this spending, you just scratch your head and say, why are we doing it? But more than anything, the ability of our government to provide pro opportunity for prosperity 
uh, whether or not it's called a social contract depends on the federal government's ability to get our federal, or I'm sorry, our fiscal house in order. And it's not just under the studies that we talk about and the, the research that uh, we put in trying to get rid of frivolous spending. I realize that's on the margins. Uh, but when people ask me what really keeps me up at night, I say honestly that I worry about waking up one morning and learning that the financial markets have already decided that the United States is no longer a good bet, that nobody wants to buy our debt anymore. And if they do, they want a premium in the form of higher interest rates. Do you know that every quarter point of an interest rate increase means $50 billion more just in debt service, money that we get virtually nothing or nothing from. If interest rates return to where they've traditionally been, uh, we will soon be using all of our so-called discretionary spending, things that we spend for defense or transportation or education or anything that is so-called discretionary just to service the debt. According to CBO, if we continue on our current trajectory, uh, that will come not much longer than a decade from now. If we get to that point, uh, we will become like Japan, where it will take decades, if not a generation, to dig out of that fiscal hole. The only way to avoid this fate, uh, we can't breeze past $20 trillion in debt uh, while we're still running half trillion dollar deficits and avoid this fate. Uh, the only way to avoid it is do what they call the grand bargain or the big deal uh, that will involve both entitlement reform and revenue measures. We all know the basic contours of such a deal. Some form of chain CPI uh, coupled with an agreement to continue to raise the age for Social Security along with uh, more aggressive means testing for Medicare. To bring in more revenue, uh, we needn't raise tax rates, but some popular deductions, uh, like we have with home mortgage interest, interest, interest uh, deductions, will have to be changed. It behooves us to move now uh, while we still have time. Now, to sum up, uh, being part of the legislative branch, uh, this may sound funny, but I still hold to the Reagan maxim, whose uh, building we're in now, that government is rarely the solution to our problems. Instead, I believe in personal freedom and individual liberty and have faith in the capacity for striving individuals to achieve on their own what government can rarely even glimpse. But given that we find ourselves in the middle of a somewhat in unpredictable education season, to put it mildly. And let me tell you, people ask me sometimes, what's the best thing about the Senate? It's a six-year term <laughs> when, you're, when you're not up every cycle like this one. That's, uh, that's uh, been nice to sit back from afar and, and watch this one a little bit. But we're in the middle of a very unpredictable election season, uh, now focusing on the relationship between individuals and governments is more than a thought experiment. Uh, in this campaign. We're grappling with these very real issues right now, though I would tend to think that uh, greater minds than mine are still confused about where we are or where we'll be. I think the best we can hope for is the fact that uh, to demand, or we ought to demand, that government uh, supports rule of law and even playing field and beyond essential functions, tries to stay out of the way of individual prosperity. I appreciate the invitation to be here today and uh, thank you again for having me.